And take a few moments to look at the closing words of Mark's gospel this morning. Turn in Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. As we ask the question, what now? What now? That question is provoked by the words, words of verse 19, so then. What now? Mark 16, 19, and 20. If you'd stand with me, I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. But we really want you to have your own Bible. So if you'd see us after the service, we'll take care of that for you. Mark's closing words, this, this gospel that we've been studying through for some time now, is closing words. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord use it in our lives this morning to just further stir us, provoking us to love and good works as we've celebrated together this Lord's Supper, and in doing that, saying, I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. I'm not my own. I'm his. He's bought me with the price of his blood. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we styled this study when we began it, the gospel in action. Not, not the gospel of in action, <laughs> the gospel in action. Because the language calls for that. But not only that, the nature of the gospel calls for that. That when we study the gospel, when we know the gospel, when the gospel becomes real to us and grips us, and by the gospel, the Holy Spirit takes and changes us from the inside out, we are stirred to action. An inactive Christian is a contradiction of terms. I've told you several times through the years I've been here about Agnes King. Agnes King was a, was a precious saint. The first time I met her, I was fresh out of seminary, and one of my tasks as an assistant pastor was to go and visit the folks in the nursing homes. And, and I had little notes about each one, and the notes on Agnes King said that she had been in the nursing home for a couple of decades, paralyzed from the neck down, as a 25-year-old seminary graduate, I thought, what am I going to say to this one? And I walked into Agnes King's room, and she lit up like the sunshine when I told her who I was. Someone had been reading to her the church newsletter, so she knew that I had come. She was looking forward to meeting me. She was such a blessing to me. Here's a woman, you would look at her and say, she is, she's inactive. And I'm telling you something, that woman was a prayer warrior. She had a ministry of edification and encouragement like few people I've known in my journey. You see, even totally paralyzed, a real Christian is not inactive. And so let's look at the closing words of this gospel in action. I want you to see four things in the text this morning. First, that as we ask, now what, or what now, After the Lord Jesus has spoken, what now? After he's, after he's taught, what now for us? Second, after the Lord Jesus has ascended, what, what now? What, after he's gone back to heaven, what now? And then the answer to those is in the next two. We are to go and declare the gospel everywhere, and we're to experience the Lord working in our witness. Let's see the text. First of all, after the Lord Jesus has spoken in verse 19, the first part of that verse, so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them. It's interesting what Peter calls Jesus, the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection. It is clear. They called him rabbi, 
teacher. But after the resurrection, he has manifested himself to them unmistakably, irrefutably, infallibly. He is the risen Lord. He is the promised Messiah. They owe him everything. And so Mark recording Peter's memoirs, so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken, and, and Mark doesn't go into great detail. You've got to weave together Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those post-resurrection narratives, and then add in there the opening verses of the book of Acts, and you get this picture of a Savior who spends 40 days after the resurrection teaching the eleven taking, I'm sure, connecting the dots. Remember when I told you such and such? Now, consider this. After he'd spoken, he spoke with authority. He was the Word of God, the Logos, the living Word of God, come down from heaven. If you were to behold him, you would behold his glory. And, and so in John's Gospel, just real quickly in the prologue there, the opening verses. I want to cite a couple of verses for you. In John chapter 1, verses 1, in, 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, or face to face there. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Before his resurrection, he was the, he was the rabbi. He was the one they hoped was Messiah. At his death on the cross, all hope disappeared. At his resurrection, it was all brought back afresh and anew with a new power and a new concentration. Verse 14 of that prologue, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. We've beheld there his glory. It was a glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The uniquely begotten one, full of grace and truth. And then again, John tells us in verses 16 to 18, for from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. Grace added to grace there. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him, that is Jesus, known. And then Paul would say it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And they were beholding his glory in the aftermath of his resurrection. The Lord spoke. And then finally the Hebrew the writer of the Hebrew letter to the Hebrew Christians, or the sermon, really, to the Hebrew Christians. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ, the living word, speaks the written word. He alone is the revelation of God. God does not speak, think about it, he does not speak to men nor will he be spoken to by anyone except through the Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, the God-man. So he spoke. What do we do after he has spoken? Well, you're going to see. What do we do after his ascension? Because the uh, in verse 19b he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. What are we to do? Well, Luke tells us in, in Luke 24, 51 about this episode. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. Think about this. As, as Jesus 
was ascending to heaven. They stood on the Mount of Ascension. And he began to ascend. And I, I, you know, movies have tried to capture what that was like. And that's just impossible. It all comes short. But he was blessing them. Can you imagine? You know, he taught the Sermon on the Mount where he, where he introduced the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn. They'll be comforted. Blessed, bless, bless. All right? As he's ascending to heaven, he is blessing. He began his ministry teaching on the mount, blessing, speaking of blessing. He, he completes his time on earth ascending into heaven, blessing them. And then actually after 1 verse 9, when he had said these things, and of course what, what Luke is referencing there is the Great Commission, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. He goes with authority. That was one of the promises he gave in the, in, in the Matthew uh, Great Commission. That all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. But he prayed about it first in John 17 too. He says, since you have given him, that is Jesus, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This ascending into heaven is a sign that he came from heaven as he had taught earlier. And he was going with all authority Romans 8, verses 31 to 34, uh, we sang uh, an allusion to this earlier. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. You see, when he ascended on high, he sat down at the right hand of God, this, this powerful picture. Then just, again, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 to 14. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He is seated. That means his work on earth is done. He has accomplished all that God gave him to do. It is finished. But he's seated at the right hand. The hand of authority, of God's authority. If you were to walk into kingly circles in medieval times, and you see the king sitting there and someone sitting to the right, that person is the hand of the king. Whatever he does carries with it the full authority of the king. And there our Jesus is our Savior, who has ascended. What now? When this Savior who came in humble circumstances, who humbled himself in obedience, even the obedience of death on a cross, who's now been highly exalted by God, what now? J.C. Ryle said, Blessed indeed is this thought, our Savior, though unseen, is a living person. We travel onward towards a dwelling where our best friend is gone to prepare a place for us. Just as John 14, 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? One writer suggested that just as John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus when he came to this earth to introduce the Son of God coming to this earth, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Even so, Jesus has gone into heaven as our forerunner to make a way to heaven for us. Our forerunner has gone. Third thing I want you to see is in the answer to what now? Now what? 
We're to go and declare the gospel everywhere. Look at verse 20, the first part. And they went out and preached everywhere. I've told you before this word preached, and you see it in the Acts several times, is the word keruso. It is they went proclaiming. They did not, it does not say they all went to seminary and got a degree so they could be preachers. No, it doesn't. They went out proclaiming. Jesus said it to the group upstairs. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death. You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. There's a sense in which if taking the Lord's Supper, knowing that reality, does not stir in us an increasing to dire, to, a desire to proclaim his death, then we have taken the Lord's Supper wrong. Wrong. There's a sense in which if we've, if we've invested the time we've invested well over a year, approaching two years, of studying through the gospel of Mark, the gospel that calls us to action, that if in the face of that we finish this gospel content to be inactive, what must be said of us? They went out and preached. Their seeing Jesus ascend into heaven gripped them to go. So, well, I can't go everywhere, Pastor. I understand. And there's some places you can't go. We prayed for a couple this morning. That many of you will, will not live out your lives where they are. You can't go everywhere. But you can go somewhere. In fact, every day, you and I go somewhere. Every day. Are we, wherever we go, proclaiming the gospel, the good news? They preached Christ. Lord willing, we're going to begin next Sunday. Paul's letter to the church, his first letter to the church at Corinth. It's about the gospel. In fact, you're going to see, I trust, the perfection of the gospel and how it brings hope and healing to an imperfect church because every church is imperfect. And I hope you see the reality that you don't have to be a perfect church to proclaim a perfect gospel, that you don't have to be a perfect Christian to proclaim a perfect gospel. So you simply have to be faithful. And these folks were faithful. Remember, Paul says on the Mount of Ascension there were over 500 brethren who saw him at one time. And when he writes the end of 1 Corinthians, he said, most of these are alive today. If you want, if you want to talk to them as eyewitnesses, you can contact most of these. <laughs> they went out and preached. You and I must as well. We must go. We do go. It'd be interesting sometimes to just be able to collect, I don't know how we do it, to collect from the time we meet on the Lord's Day to the time we see one another on the next Lord's Day, where every individual went during the week, how many places we go. You say, well, I go some of those same places every day. What a great opportunity for a foothold, for long-term cultivation, for stirring, building, Sowing, planting, watering the gospel. Some places you go are unique. You'll never go back. But you see, if we really believe that this culture is getting darker and darker, and if you're, if you're listening to radio, if you're looking at the newspaper, if you're watching the news, you have got to believe it's getting darker and darker and darker. Civility, common civility, has bit the dust in this culture. It's dark, increasingly dark. Here's the good news. Wherever you go, if you have the Lord Jesus Christ living in you, wherever you go, you take light in that situation. We sang it as little children. I think it may have been in the sunbeams that I first learned this song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. 
this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. I won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Remember that song? Some of us cut our teeth on that. You go. Say, well, the world is a dark place. Oh, it is. It's distressing to see what's become of America. But the good news is, where you and I go, there's light. And the even better news is, light has never shut out darkness. Never has, never will. All it takes for this culture to become increasingly dark and darker and darker is for us to hide our little light under a bushel. But take the bushel off, light. They went everywhere. Last thing I want you to see is that we are to experience the Lord working in our witness. Verse 20, the second part. While the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Are you seeing the Lord work in your witness? I'll tell you what happens. Sometimes you go through a season where you don't, where you don't see the power of God in the gospel injecting itself in the lives of those you encounter and you begin to doubt, you begin to give up hope, you begin to anticipate that nothing will happen. And guess what? When it comes to the gospel, if you think nothing will happen, nothing will happen. Because you see, we're taught in, in James that you have not because you ask not. Yet Jesus promised, keep on knocking, it will be opened. Keep on asking, it will be given. Keep on seeking, you will find. This instant society, instant coffee, instant tea, uh, fast food, it's, it's, it's made us accustomed to the quick fix. It's not Jesus' way. Go. Lord, work in me. We read from Philippians. Work out your salvation or work at your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. I ask myself, I ask you, are you experiencing the working of God in your witness? Because that's what he expects. That's what he's willing to give. If we're not witnessing, there'll be no working. It's just, just, just plain as day. We said to you when we... When 2017 dawn that we should always be ready to give an answer to anyone who would ask us why we have hope. You have people asking you, what do you think about all this stuff going on? What about what our new president's doing? What about how people are responding to that? Well, it looks pretty bleak, except for this. And you can give them a reason that you have hope. When a lot of people are crying doom and gloom. A lot of people are pointing the fingers. No. Are you experiencing God working in your witness? Do you want that? Do you cry for that? Do you, oh God. The gospel is a message that calls us to action. We said that when we began this study. And because we're creatures of habit, and we talked about that first of the year, that we need to cultivate new habits, some, some vital behaviors as disciples who want to make disciples. And we talked about that, being willing to, to intentionally look for three people to bless during the week, uh, one of whom is not a member of the church that you're a member of, to be willing to take time to eat. And that doesn't mean a full seven-course meal. It can, mean, it can mean coffee. It can mean dessert. It can mean a snack. It, it, can, it can mean an apple. It can mean anything just to sit down and share time with people. Three people a week. To learn to listen. 
to be quiet, to be still, to listen to the Lord. And I promise you, as we listen to the Lord, you're going to hear him say, go, my child. Go, as you listen to the Lord, you're gonna, you're gonna, he's going to bring to your, into your visage, into your field of view, people that you need to pray for, people that you need to touch. He's going to show you, as he shows me, remaining sin, sinful habits that are, that are hindering and need to be slain, need an axe put to the root to so Listen. To learn more of Christ. My evangelist professor said in seminary, if we would talk more to God about men and women and boys and girls whom we want to see saved, he said we cannot help but talk more to those men and women and boys and girls. And when we're not doing that, I think it begs the question, are we talking to God about them? To learn be more like Christ than to realize that we're sent and to track that. I'm still struggling with journaling, by the way. I'm horrible at journaling. But God be my helper. I'm going to get good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a journal before I go to heaven. I'm going to do that. To jot down, how, how, did, I, how did I make a kingdom impact this week? Who, who did I touch this week? How's so and so that I'm praying for? What? Who did I bless this week? Am I, am I living sent? Go. How am I seeing God work in my witness? If you track that, vital behaviors, cultivating habits, you'll learn some things about yourself. Some things you'll be provoked to bless God for. Some things you'll repent for. That's the gospel of Mark. The gospel in action. The gospel that calls us to action because the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ came and lived, walked this earth in human form, has ascended back to heaven as the God-man Paul told Timothy, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He's gone ahead. He's made the way. He's leading many sons to glory. Men, women, boys, girls, who one day by grace through faith will be with him in glory, and I would remind you in this context of the Lord's Supper that he said he would not do what he did that night at Passover. He would not eat the bread and drink the cup until he gathered all of his own in the marriage supper of the Lamb in glory. So ask yourself, has studying this gospel provoked you to action? Paul talks about believing in vain, hearing in vain. I don't want any one of you, my brothers and sisters, to hear in vain. I don't want any one of us, myself included, to be simply hearers of the word and not doers. Paul says such are deceived. Oh, brothers and sisters, this gospel... The story, the good news of Jesus Christ coming and living and dying and rising again for sinners, it calls us to action. Now what? Now what? What now? What now? Go. Everywhere. Everywhere you go. Take the name of Jesus with you. Go. Look for Pray for, expect God to work in your witness. Go to bless. Go to share. Get better at going as you learn to listen to the Lord. As you learn to be more like Jesus. Go. 
Because you know that Jesus said, if he, if he was standing here today, he would say to you what he said to them, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we bow before you in Jesus' name, and oh, Father, forgive us when, when, we, when we're inclined, when it's, it's too easy simply to take in the gospel, to take in the good news, to, to, to relish in the, in the glory of God shown in Jesus Christ to save our souls, and, and, and we let ourselves stop there and not st- are stirred to go, that the gospel brings dead men to life so that living temples of Jesus Christ can serve and share and go. And, oh, God. Help us to be disciples with a longing to see others to come, become disciples. And don't let us get caught up in a culture of religious lethargy. May this study we've gone through, this gospel, that is full of action, provoking us, holy, evangelical action, for your glory, for our sanctification, for the good of the souls we know who are not yet followers of Jesus, for the advance of your gospel in the coming of your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.